Welcome back to the Quiet on Set podcast. <laughs> Wait, sorry, what was that? Nothing. Wait, that wasn't sorry. part of supposed to be part of the intro, right? No, no, no. no sorry. Okay, okay. Welcome back to the Quiet on Set podcast. I'm Young Graf, and as always, yeah. I'm joined by Lacklantili. <laughs> Did I not distract you? Did I not get? Did I, get, I, didn't get I it a second still, because I was looking at the camera, I couldn't, I could only see it in my peripheral. What you were showing, or holding up there, so I, okay. I still didn't. Anyway, see it. on episode one hundred and seventy-eight, it's trailers galore. That's right, a ton of trailers dropped. Some goodies, some not as good goodies. Uh, we'll talk about a bunch of them soon. You rewatched some of the Ghostbusters film, or, or at least the original, right? Yes, that that's you. You did that. Uh, I caught Civil War early, uh, the latest from Alex Garland. I got some thoughts on that. And then I also finished Masters of the Air and Free Body Problem. Uh, caught the first two episodes of X-Men 97. And I also watched Edge of Tomorrow. Finally, we watched two films for our feature topic. Two completely different kind of films. Uh, one is Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, the latest in the rebooted Ghostbusters uh, series, and a remake of a 80s classic, Roadhouse. So um, without further ado, we got a lot to cover today, so let's queue up the intro and get into the show. We are professionals. Like, this, is, this is a professional podcast. Yes. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Hello there. <laughs> Which actually, Did you this get is going to be a bit... Well? Um, yes. So I've got Dune Cam. It's just a camera <laughs> with my Dune steelbook. All right, Lachlan, welcome back. You were flashing something Bonjour. in the intro. Can, can you do that again? Was it like a Ghostbuster 4K or what did you... Uh, it was more... Uh, of course it was more. <laughs> <laughs> every, every The biggest episode. ghost but of them all. It's haunting. I did get a, a bunch of 4Ks this week. I, uh... So, 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 uh... One's not a 4K. One's just a, a Blu-ray. Mmm. Koreeda, I love it. Of course, broker. broker. Uh, and then I got this. Ghost Dog. I haven't seen this one. Jim Jarmusch. So I yeah. started watching it. I think he has a new film. Oh, hang on. My microphone fell. Stay. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I've started watching that and I was enjoying it. Uh, but then mm. we had to record this. So it is on pause. And then. Ooh, Rise of the Planet Rise of the Rise of the Apes. Planet of the Apes. Uh huh. There's more. Dawn. Dawn. Of the planet of the apes. Yeah. War, war of the planet of the apes. War. Oh, mm -hmm. all on 4K. Uh, very excited to sit down and watch those because I have yeah. only really, I, I think I've only seen Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Uh, oh, really? I think I tried. I think I tried watching Dawn a few years ago, wow. and I just don't know what it was, but I just wasn't enjoying it. So I'm yeah. gonna sit down and kind of lord of the rings trilogy it and watch them all because they're not very long films yeah 140 they're... 130 104 so the first one's the shortest but uh yeah um, i'll be keen to watch them it's also like the one that is the most like different from the rest of the the franchise it's such a like the other ones are like they're closer in in what the topics are first one is kind of i don't know so, so out there but i mean we got a new one, the fourth one, uh, which said like way later. So it's, I guess not really part of this um, franchise anymore. That it's kind of a, a uh, uh, upended, um, like concluded trilogy. But but that one's out like uh, the tenth of May. So not not yeah, too far like off. Yeah, that's like the Secrets of Dumbledore spinoff, right? Like a yeah, that, they that's made Caesar like the gay in this spin -off. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I'd like to see what they do with the the spinoff. But um, I'd yeah. like to go back and give this another go and watch yeah. it all. Yeah, uh, I'd probably do the same because uh, they they are definitely worth revisiting. And I I had in my mind they were longer, but that's even more attractive to to go rewatch them if they're only like uh, around a hundred minutes, and maybe a little bit more than that. Thank you so much for uh, the 4K corner. No that was my that was my DVD haul. Uh, but there are some news that we are going to cover. And uh, like you said in the intro, trailer galore this week. Uh, we have, um, I think, seven, se yeah, se I, I, seven trailers. Uh, actually, eight, because there's two trailers for one of them, <laughs> for one of the properties uh, that came out. Uh, the first one, Alien Romulus. We're both uh, big fans of the Alien franchise, Fede Alvarez. Uh, has has done has dipped his toes into the uh, I guess franchise uh, horror genres before when he did Evil Dead, which was a really bloody version, 
uh, and take on that franchise. I didn't love the film. I still think it, it wasn't bad overall. And from what I got in this teaser was that this seemed to be quite brutal. And uh, apparently I think it's set between Alien and Aliens, uh, the two OGs. And uh, yeah, it looked really great. Uh, again, it's just a short little teaser, but I'm very excited for August 16th. No, I'm very keen for this. It looks super, super cool. Uh, mm. The director of Don't Breathe and Evil Dead. I wasn't in consumed by those films, but I did find there were a lot of really interesting elements to those films. And I just think that with an established IP, there's a possibility that those foundations are set and he's just going to add some of the most brutal killings in the entire alien series so i'll be i'll be super keen to to watch this i mean also the alien they, they look smaller right smaller versions so they're more agile there's a it's, it's harder to fight them at least uh, well, there's a bunch that's... of face huggers yeah face uh, yeah face huggers there i mean there's a ton yeah, of face huggers which are terrifying they uh they are in the other ones of course as well i can't remember like when they pop up first it, definitely not in the first one right uh, at least I can't remember. Face it's huggers. been a while since I've seen. Yeah, are they are they in the first one already? No, they are the right? Um, and then I just no, didn't remember. But uh, yeah, it's just because a the alien, a like actual the big one, is so iconic that the the face hugger thing. It's just a terrifying concept overall. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's used again and again in different properties, but in Alien, in that universe, uh, because it's so slimy and everything. Uh, and and he leans really into like making it gory. Uh, this could be uh, very promising and actually pretty terrifying. Uh, but yeah, we usually don't uh, cover like the third, the second, the second, the final trailer of a movie because we are not the production houses doing the marketing for it. But uh, the Fall Guy had a second trailer that came out, and you know when we discussed the first one, I kind of said that um. Again, I, I just, there's something with me and Emily Blunt where I don't really connect with whatever she's doing and it's totally on my end, <laughs> not her fault at all. It's totally me. Uh, and I just overall thought the film didn't look great in this trailer, uh, in the first one. In the second one, I'm like, okay, I can see why there was so much hype from South by Southwest. This seems to be a really fun film with a ton of action, with a ton of actually like pretty good humor, uh, funny bits, and mainly I was like, Ryan Gosling is the fucking man. Cause he uh, nails this. He has so much charisma in, in the, this trailer, uh, in this role. Uh, I'm very keen for the Fall Guy, for the Fall Guy now. Uh, I don't know how you felt. Did it uh, make you more excited for the Fall Guy? I was already pretty keen. Uh, also, I don't know why you don't like Emily Blunt. Like, I, I don't know either, man. I, I really don't know thing. either. It's I'm just, putting that uh, all on you. Yeah. It's all on you. Uh, but what I will say is I agree. This trailer gave Gosling a lot of charisma. I think the first trailer was edited really weird to kind of be like, here's Emily Blunt, here's Ryan Gosling. This one is romance. definitely more about the actual film itself. But for me, the the charisma that Gosling was giving in it has made me starting to put a list of all of the Gosling films I want to yeah. watch slash rewatch because I've watched a yeah. lot of his stuff, but I haven't seen everything. So I want to kind of go through his filmography, uh, which is why live on the air we were gonna do a, a bracket for for Garland and Godzilla. Can we just do a Gosling uh -huh. bracket instead? <laughs> Well, I don't think we have time un uh, until, like, uh, Fall Guy comes out. And these other ones we don't really have to rewatch. Re I was thinking actually the same thing when I was watching this new trailer that, like, wouldn't it be fun to go back and rewatch a lot of Ryan Gosling? Because we haven't done a bracket yet that is focused on a actor, a performer. Uh, we've only done ones on directors. And, uh, yeah, Gosling is at the top of my list. And you can make different arguments in there as well. It doesn't need to go to the best movie overall it could be like the best performance uh where he gets to shine the most so uh yeah we'll keep that we'll keep that in mind uh i'm sure there's no short supply of uh new um ryan gosling films uh quicker turnaround to directors you know um actors can appear in like two three films a year uh but uh we can we can get that going i, I just don't think for the fall guy we'll be able to rewatch that many that many of his films but um 
I'm down, I'm down. I guess speaking of, of a franchise that could be uh, covered in bracket form, um, Furiosa and the Mad Max saga uh, has, I guess, its fifth entry in the saga with uh, Furiosa Mad Max story. Uh, it also was just announced that it's opening or... I guess on the second day of the Gun Film Festival this year, uh, this one will play out of competition. Uh, it comes out on May 24th anyway, so it's just kind of a, a 10 day or 9 day uh, earlier premiere at the fest. Uh, I think this second trailer uh, really showed a bit more of um, the story, maybe I'd say a bit too much of the story as well um a lot of the character progressions and we can see that it, it doesn't really span just like one long car chase like in uh fury road it actually is uh, i guess a um story that spans over over a couple different years but uh Lachlan, there was some uh, early thoughts that came out from the first trailer that uh some of the the digital looking aspects of the trailer didn't look great uh has the second trailer um, I, I don't know if I don't remember what you said about it if it bothered you or not but um, yeah is this second trailer kind of uh, made you change your mind about it or are you still uh, excited for Fury or something? I honestly think that they may have released that first trailer a little too early I think they may have had some time to go through and fix up some of the visual effects side of things because this trailer definitely looks a lot cleaner than what the other one mm -hmm. does now I Still, if we're comparing it to Fury Road, Fury Road was very, very well done in a practical sense. This film mm. doesn't seem to have that same level of practicality. At least if yeah. it would, they would be advertising it that way. But I know that this film was in production hell for a very decent long time. So, mm. yeah, look, I'm watching the trailer now and I honestly don't think I've got any issues with it at all yeah uh we'll see what it Me comes neither. out i i have faith george miller's a fantastic director he, he knows how to put together a film so yeah. whether it's less maybe he just was like you know what fury road was just too much work i would rather just want i just want to release a, a, a more traditional story with action and and, and have something a little bit more personal because i feel like this is yeah. going to be a bit more personal story yeah a uh, bit more of a hero's journey the uh mm. although she seems to be not very talkative which is i guess a uh trademark for <laughs> for these last two films uh have you uh, did you end up watching 3000 years of longing no no i didn't because uh i i caught that one uh in in gun in 2021 uh, uh 2022 my first time at the festival and um to me what stood out there is that the cgi looked similar to this um and i wasn't the biggest fan but he also did like time period uh in the desert some stuff like that with a genie um so it had like similar aesthetics to 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 a point um and i just saw that kind of repeated and they they kind of stood out a bit in my opinion in three thousand years of longing and i just hope they don't stand out in furiosa uh, but I mean, the talent on screen uh, is certainly great. It, it didn't it had me a bit concerned about Chris Hemsworth. I'm I'm really rooting for this performance to to go over well. But I got no concerns about Anya Taylor Joy. She's the queen of just uh, walking around in the desert. I I guess this year from uh, Dune two to this, and yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And we don't have to wait for it too much longer. Uh, the next trailer is actually like. You know, a smaller one um, that uh, I think the film played at Sundance or South by Southwest somewhere uh, in a violent nature comes out on May uh, May 31st. And it's uh, basically a uh, slasher film told from the perspective of the killer. And you're just like uh, in his little backpack, basically on his back as he goes around killing people. And I think from what I've heard, that's, that's essentially the whole film. Uh, yeah, Lachlan, what did you think about this trailer? Uh, yeah, I'm keen. Uh, I, I'm happy to put on a slow pace slasher film and, and just let it flow, you know? I, I'm happy to do yeah. that. But yeah, I've, I've heard, I've heard mixed things from different people, but yeah, that doesn't matter because I kind of seem interested in it. So I'm going to watch it mm -hmm. anyway. Nature is unforgiving. That's, nature is unforgiving. It's violent, but it's beautiful. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this because it's uh it's it's different it's it's so different and i yearn for something different 
in movies. So uh, yeah, uh, which speaking of something different, uh, much more of the same is what we get in uh, the second film um, in, I guess, uh, Zack Snyder's uh, rejected Star Wars project uh, produced now by Netflix in Rebel Moon, The Scaregiver, that uh, will be out uh, conveniently when Lachlan is away on holiday so uh he definitely didn't schedule that around so he doesn't have to talk about this film i think we didn't even cover the first one uh we talked about something else th uh, that week but rebel moon 2 uh is coming uh to netflix straight to dvd uh dune at home is what someone called it in the comments right you, you, we had a good laugh at the at the comments just a second ago but yeah, Lachlan, do you think, um, I mean, you got hyped for the first trailer and you were like, I'm going in, this could be very good. And then it's the movie. Well, we all saw the movie. Uh, hopefully you didn't, but but we did. Uh, do you have higher hopes for, for the second one? This is his June 2 moment. I'm calling it right now. Yeah. It's his June 2 moment. It's going to be bigger, better. It's going to be more fantastic. There's going to be more story to chew on. It's going to be a visual feast. This is mm -hmm. Zack Snyder's June 2 moment. I'm, I'm calling it right now. Fair. Okay. Well, well, we're very keen once you get back from holiday, uh, if you end up watching it. Or as, as God intended, uh, which is uh, equivalent to Zack Snyder, as you are at, at the beach, you know, on your holiday, you're just watching it on your your apple watch or something like that exactly then uh speaking of rejected uh star wars property to the ones that i guess are getting made over at disney uh with the accolade uh on out on june 4th we got the next uh, mini series that's gonna land on disney plus uh i saw that this trailer uh, like got quite a a few views uh when it dropped i think it's like nearing 10 million or at least it's like around eight when I last checked it, uh, but it had uh, a lot of dislikes, more dislikes than likes, uh, about 160,000 or something like that. Um, I watched the trailer and I thought like, I mean, it doesn't look great. It doesn't, like, I don't want to leave a dislike on this. It's, it's not that bad, but uh, did I miss something, Lachlan? Did, did you something there that, that, that I didn't? Uh, no, uh, I didn't think the trailer was any, anything crazy, but yeah. I didn't think the trailer was like dude terrible. Yeah, I don't I don't know where the hate is coming from. Maybe maybe it's like the typical uh brain breaking um I guess dialogue about every single Disney project being too woke and people dislike it for for that reason. I I don't I don't even know. It's so Oh, it's because people mind -numbing. of color are playing Jedi's. Okay, shut the fuck up. Oh no. <laughs> I, I don't know if that if that's it, but that's like to me when there's a nonsensical hate around something it's probably that, or there's women, or something, uh, like something else. Really, this, uh, it's just uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's just uh, what about the trailer though? Uh, to me, it didn't look like super interesting, but um, I, I, I don't know. Just like, this wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it looked like a normal Star Wars TV show on Disney Plus, and that was the worst part. Yeah, unfortunately, it does look a bit, a, a bit like they did the playing dress up. It, like the something about the costume design and the textures and but also the way that it's filmed it seems so um for lack of a better term i think it seems more commercial than it does cinematic you know the way that you that you light it the way that you shoot it and these these last couple uh projects coming out of um star wars apart from from andor have had that same kind of issue in my opinion, like even some other Disney Plus shows have had that issue. I don't know if it comes with the the, the dome or, or yeah, I think the dome is what mm. it's called. Uh, or if it's like another tech thing or what it is, but it just it stood out to me um, in a not so great way. But um, I'll be watching it because I'm, I'm watching everything. Hopefully they sent me some screeners regardless. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I really don't get the hate for this. My one. favorite part, my favorite part. Of this, okay. Ready, yeah. ready. Yeah. Anyone can die. That is very exciting because we. When don't I know watched who they Kenobi, are. I was like, I was like, yeah. I know who's gonna die. I know who's not gonna die. Fair, Both yeah. Kenobi and Darth Vader are not going to kill each other right now because there are fucking movies set after this, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I know that in Andor, like, yes, there's a whole series, 
but I know he dies. So I know that no matter what the stakes are, he does not die at this moment in the Andor series. He dies when he's getting the plans to the Rebellion. Yeah. So the exciting thing about this show, for me at least, is it's, for most part, I, I don't really know what the story yeah. is going to be about, and I don't really know who is going to be, like, alive at the end and dead at the end so that that keeps me engaged and i hopefully they will yeah. just hopefully someone gets stabbed with a lightsaber they'll die they won't just live like every other <laughs> no, no, no. person has on disney plus tv shows in the past couple years no they they have a, a season long running co contract luckily you can't them kill them off then bring qui-gon back from the dead <laughs> I, I saw some uh, parallels and some videos that people made that like, you know, the inspired stuff from where they, where they say like, oh, this is so similar to Star Wars with Dune. Um, and it's interesting that Dune is essentially like the, the roadmap for all of these other like fantasy and sci-fi projects uh, similar to, I guess, the, you know, the, the Qui-Gon Jinn comparisons uh, to the Lisa Al Gaib with uh, Javier Bardem being uh, so ready to to die for the cause uh similar to how like qui-gon jinn trains like those parallels that uh maybe they're sometimes a bit reaching but the, the story bits are kind of there uh and uh, yeah um really some good stuff out there that i read this week but something i'm very excited for uh because the first season in my opinion nailed it out of the park was a uh, house of the dragon and we got uh two trailers uh, as uh, kind of the, the kingdom is, is split, there's oh, there's trouble, a foot war is is bound to happen uh, soon. Um, on Dragonback as well as from what we got in the trailer, and we got two separate trailers, uh, a green one and a black one for I guess uh, two. <laughs> First I was like, wait, did I miss something? Since when do we have like black trailer and green trailer? I thought there was like red band and green band. I was like, what is happening? HBO, what are you doing? And I was like, okay, cool. It takes two different perspectives for uh, essentially uh, I guess doing the <laughs> Jacob versus Edward uh, debate, but for Game of Thrones uh, nerds. Um, I... I'm so intrigued in what they got to offer and we got a, a starting date for the premiere june 16th uh i'm very much looking forward to this luckland i assume it's it's going to be the same for you very keen excited yeah do you have go a preference team, between team black go team black i was about to ask you i also am more inclined to lean team black uh maybe it's just uh you know because they got the the incest down a bit better <laughs> And it's, uh, you know, it's in true Game of Thrones fashion, you got to do that uh, to, to be liked. Uh, but no, um, What's her name? both sides. Uh, of the dragon. That's the thing. To me, I was like, oh, holy shit. Don't they all kind of have the same name um, in a blonde racist way, Targaryen way? Uh, they all have the same name. So I'm definitely rewatching. Yeah, I'm definitely rewatching season one before this comes out. I like the whole series and I'm rewatching it. Daenerys. Oh wait, hang on. With Daenerys? No, that's that's the one from. The, she she's the. Uh, that's from the first game, I think. Amelia Clark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Renera Targaryen. There we go. That's it for uh, the trailers this week. Let us know what um what you're most excited about. Uh, seems to be a really busy schedule for the last for the next um month and a half, and then I'm off hopefully to Gun. Uh, so yeah, a few exciting weeks ahead of us. Um, something else, you know, Lachlan, we grow up in the early, uh, mid two thousands and there was a certain game that, um, there was no way of getting around. Either you played it yourself or you had, uh, a, a girlfriend at a time who was really into it. it, it you're bound to have had some run in with the Sims and, uh, apparently a Sims movie, uh, is uh, in the works with uh, Margot Robbie uh, producing. And um, yeah, I, gu I guess they're taking from the formula of, hey, she did Barbie, so I guess this other property uh, is going to work with her as well. Um, yeah, Lachlan, what do you think? Uh, can they make a Sims movie work or is this just silly? I've never played The Sims. You've never played The Sims? Nor That's have crazy. I had anyone around me that's obsessed with the sims so that's that. wow your assumption is wrong 
yeah, that's just you're missing out. The Sims is 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 a cultural. Um, I landmark. have no idea how they're gonna make uh, adapt a Sims movie, but they somehow adapted a Barbie movie, so we'll see. Yeah, I mean, with Sims, you could go more in the like the Lego Movie route, where you have an in-universe thing, and then turns out it was all controlled, and, uh, something like that. That could be pretty fun. Um, but yeah, I I don't know how they would do this either. Uh, where it's not like two separate realities, one the controlling one yeah. and one the, the in. But we'll see, we'll see. I mean, um, then uh, for Gun Twenty Twenty Four, we teased it before. Uh, Furiosa is uh, set to premiere there. There's also the rest of uh, the program, um, a bunch of other films that are rumored. I ended up um, last night <laughs> spending uh, already an, an hour plus just like researching a bunch, reading articles and assembling a list. I'll have that link below of, of all the potential titles. I think I have like 70 movies on that list. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to once they do announce uh, those titles, some uh, very interesting films that uh, ended up being put onto my radar that might not end up premiering in Gun, but uh, maybe later down the stretch, maybe even in 2025. But I already have it on my radar, so that was a very productive afternoon. We'll we'll see what what the rest will be for Gun, um, and hopefully I will be attending. Um, but yeah, that's it for the news. Uh, in the meantime, you can uh, leave us a rating on Spotify and on Apple Podcast and uh, through the links below for this week for Roadhouse, for example, if you want to watch the film yourself and you want to support us uh, while doing so, you can use the Amazon link. Even if you buy anything else, doesn't matter what, you can use it like way later. If you use our link to get to Amazon, buy something, we get, get a kickback from it. And it's greatly appreciated directly goes into the fund to uh i guess go to these festivals and everything else that uh comes up with the show so uh thanks so much for doing all of that uh and then also i wanted to mention that next week uh, hopefully if all goes right we will be covering election one and two uh the movies that kevin chose as the winner of our oscar prediction bracket and uh, we'll also have them linked there uh, with an amazon link uh if you want to uh, check him out yourself uh hong kong cinema uh that from johnny cho uh, i haven't seen them neither of us has but uh kevin speaks very highly on them uh, them so be on the lookout next week for a review for those two films but with that all out of the way let's get to what we've been watching this week All right, Lachlan, uh, hit me. Apart from those uh, 4Ks that you got, what have you been up to? Uh, so I watched Ghostbusters. Uh, and yeah, I don't see the correlation to Frozen Empire, how it continues right. on with the story. There's, there's some people who act in this, like a lot of people. Even there's a callback to a guy that wants to stop them in this first one, and he's back for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, but but he's back. Yeah, and yeah. there's Bill Murray. So when I was, we'll get to one. a bit later, I guess. Uh, there's, but there's, there's like connections. With, with, so with Frozen Empire, there's there's connections to Ghostbusters. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a bit of a weird one then because you know you had you had a you had a pretty stacked cast with this original yeah, Ghostbusters. Yeah. Um, you had Kristen Wiig, Melissa McCarthy, Kate McKinnon, <laughs> Leslie Jones, Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. Yeah. And none of them showed up in the sequel. <laughs> so I have no idea what the fuck's going on. Uh, you tell no, me there is, was no is, one. Uh, this is the, the feminist universe, you know, in sense of the multiverse. It's the one that they cut off from the main existence. Because uh, there's women in the film and that one didn't do well. So it doesn't exist in a universe where Bill Murray also exists. Oh, right. I haven't okay. seen that one. Well my mistake then uh because i missed the little thing afterwards that says afterlife i actually watched ghostbusters afterlife this week uh mm. which is the movie that i watched uh just the original uh, well the original of the new series the, the start of the new series the original ghostbusters is the original ghostbusters and then you've got ghostbusters <laughs> 2 then you've got obviously ghostbusters which came out in like 2016 now you've got ghostbusters afterlife and ghostbusters frozen empire so to make that less confusing for you, um, watch the first one. Don't watch the second one. It's not as good, but it's still pretty good. Don't watch the third one. This this one here, uh, I actually quite enjoyed. I thought it was uh, cute, enjoyable, fun. I had no qualms with it. 
uh, especially that J.K. Simmons uh, <laughs> fucking uh, cameo at the end really, really got me laughing. Uh, but other than that, yeah, had a great time. Yeah, I gave it three stars. Now I'm set up to watch Frozen Empire. Yeah, I, I like the one the most where there's uh, a guy in a man mansion and um, he's got like a green suit and he's Italian. Um, Haunted Mansion? That's Yeah, that's my favorite Ghostbuster movie. I think it's the Japanese yep. version of it. What's your favorite ghost movie? A <laughs> uh, ghost <laughs> with Patrick Swayze. Yeah. Tying it back to uh, to uh, yeah to um, Roadhouse, I guess. Boring. To the original Roadhouse. Ghost. Uh, Casper. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that many ghost movies at the top. A top ghost of my story. Head. A ghost story. I haven't seen that one. Um, but ah, oh, that's fantastic. Dan Lowry apparently has a, has a new film. Yeah, guys, I don't know. It's the only ghost that just kind of popped into my mind. Poltergeist. Geist means ghost in German. So Yep. There you go. So, That's it. Do you want to tell me, tell me yeah. more? Tell me more. Tell me more. Give me some other random random ones. Well, polter means like it's it's making a lot of noise. That's polter in a way. So okay. poltergeist means a a ghost that makes a lot of like noise. Noisy ghost. Okay. In a way. Oh, yeah. Interesting. There you go. Uh, German conjuring? lesson of the day. The, those ghosts? Conjuring, Gonjour uh, is actually uh, French, and it's Ooh. uh, it's actually short for um, six cents. Uh, bonjour, but Gonjour is when you don't wish someone a bon means good, and Gon means I guess bad. So it's like Gonjour actually means like it's it's a bad day. I wish you a bad day. Conjuring. Don't fact check me on that one. Got it. Um, six cents. Yeah. Yes, good ghost movie, bad ghost movie. I think it's overrated. <laughs> but wow. it's just I, I I don't I don't like it as much as other people do. Uh but I watched it after Jeez. obviously knowing the twist already. Uh and I yeah. I don't think it holds up knowing the twist. I am wow, personally. You you just love causing <laughs> chaos, don't you? you just, I you hate wanna, kids. You hate you hate children. I do hate children. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh the shining? Account? The yeah. Shining? Uh, not really, no. Eh, it's got ghosts in it. But then again, oh, Beetlejuice. I've, There's a trailer that dropped that, that we didn't talk about. Uh, yeah, I think it just dropped. I, I think it, it Beetlejuice, kind of... Beetlejuice trailer that dropped. Uh, that was that was a cute little trailer. I'm I'm interested. I'll I'll watch it. I haven't seen it, the original and and the trailer for for this new one. Um, so something. Oh, like really? You haven't with. seen the original Beetlejuice? No, no, I just yeah, right. No. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Not wow. familiar with juicing missed, those missed Beatles. opportunity, man. Yeah. Are we just gonna continue talking about ghost <laughs> movies or <laughs> the rest. until until I'm like I don't want to talk about the stuff that I watched. Uh, I'll, I'll keep mine brief as as much as I I can. Um, but Phantom of the Opera. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> for <laughs> we should slowly bridge into like um movies that are clearly not ghost films but we pretend they're like ghosts yeah yeah uh but uh no Fast wait and furious what wait my Seven. favorite one is uh, there's a ghost is, at the end boo bitch <laughs> boo bitch boo bitch wait what is it <laughs> yeah boo bitch it's a netflix film with i think lana Can uh, candor where she's uh <clears throat> She she dies in a car crash and she becomes a, a ghost. Yeah. And uh, well, has to that learn very much links lesson. onto my my one that I said, which was Fast and Furious Seven. There's a ghost at the end. <laughs> God. Uh, but yeah, I watched some stuff this week. Uh, the continued, uh, I guess, X Men series from the nineties uh, gets continued with X Men ninety seven. Uh, Lachlan, have you ever watched any 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 of those uh, original cartoons of the X Men? No. I think it's for us. We are a bit too young to, I guess, have, have caught them on TV. They were airing, uh, I think, in the early or mid '90s, and um, yeah, I never caught up with them in that way. But I've uh, watched these first two uh, episodes that are out now, and it's now airing weekly. And I think it's, uh, it looks really good. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I was like, mm. damn, okay, this is like it's silly. It's very much a cartoon made for that that works for for children as well. But with that, I think it um, is pretty fun comic book stuff. Uh, I'll definitely be continuing the series and actually uh, made me interested in uh, maybe checking out the uh, the original uh, animated series myself. So, yeah, we'll see. 
Uh, the Masters of the Air concluded, uh, you know, in the uh, it's it's the third and final of these like novel adaptations of these World War Two fil um, films. Uh, the first one, the most successful one, was uh, the miniseries of Band of Brothers that came out like twenty years ago now. Uh, and this one's the one where they're flying, and there's one when they're where they're on boats, and uh, it's I think a pretty good show. I think it lost a bit of its steam and ultimately like its narrative drive uh halfway through uh the season i think it could have nailed some stuff a bit better uh but ultimately i think it's still worthwhile uh but i wouldn't put it up there as something that is gonna be like as remembered as band of brothers is still like this iconic show that I, I haven't seen myself but um people bring it up again and again as like one of the best, best miniseries ever made uh masses of the air won't be among them but it's still really solid uh then last week i mentioned that i had seen half of uh free body problem uh season one is definitely like a show that would continue because it's part of i think a trilogy or quarter trilogy of of novels and this first one feels really like a setup for the larger story that is about to to happen um I didn't love it, to be honest, uh, and I didn't have time ultimately to uh, finish the the book. I was I was listening to the audiobook and I, I didn't get it done in time. But uh, I I I I might, but it didn't have me super intrigued. But but hey, more dystopian sci-fi, I guess, if you're into that. Then Alex Garland. A lot of people are going to be anticipating this one, Civil War, uh, got called a masterpiece by some uh, coming out of South by Southwest. Uh, a Civil War fi film that is inherently not about the current politics like at all, uh, like at all. <laughs> it has no connection in the slightest, uh, which is kind of ultimately also maybe its point that how it's, it's, it's so pointless overall. It's just about uh, these journalists who try to get, uh, a, I guess, a story, uh, go through war-torn uh, America on... It's a road trip film, essentially. And um, it's pretty thrilling. I think the filmmaking is great. I didn't love some of the narrative beats that characters go through, but it's has that sort of, uh, like, glass-cutting uh, tension that uh, you're just on the edge of your seat for uh, really long stretches at a time. Um, so... Technically, uh, like the sound, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this one gets uh, a sound nod at really early, but I guess at next year's Oscars, I think it's that strong sound-wise. Um, and yeah, really thrilling film. I wouldn't call it a masterpiece. I think I had higher expectations. Uh, I ended up giving it like a 7 out of 10, uh, but still feel like it's a really solid film. And I watched Edge of Tomorrow. Uh, I was uh, <laughs> shamed into doing that because uh, I had never seen it. And um, yeah, it's surprising, right? Lachlan, are you are you a big fan of, of Edge of Tomorrow or? I really like Edge of Tomorrow. Are you in the camp of me? It's just a solid action film. It's nothing much beyond that, I guess. I think it's like a lot of fun. <laughs> Keeping it brief. I'll keep it brief as well. I think it's pretty fun as well. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's good action, good like slight sci-fi stuff with uh, the robots that they're fighting and um, I guess the Groundhog Day type of repeating the same day over and over again. Uh, apparently, they're making a sequel potentially to this, right? Is what I've heard. That would be interesting. That would Edge be interesting, right? How do you yesterday? continue this, this story? Hmm? Edge of the day after. Edge of today. <laughs> Still edging. Tomorrow. <laughs> to goon or not to goon? Uh, mine are slightly more sexual, which maybe is caused by me watching Roadhouse uh, last night before I went to bed. Uh, the original from um, 1989 and <laughs> my short letterbox review just said it's way too horny for its own good this this movie is incredibly horny there's like so much nudity in this um and just i don't know it's not greasy enough for the greasy behavior that is happening in this film and i can see where why it's a core classic because like the action is kind of where it, it stands out a bit it's it's as over the top as the new one is in that in that sense like there's two really big explosions for for no reason whatsoever it's like a house blows up but it's usually on fire and then it just has like a gasoline explosion as if it's like um a, ga a gas station um <laughs> it's so over the top at points but uh i get why it's a core classic but 
Um, yeah, I liked I liked the new one actually a bit more than than this one, but we'll get into that uh, in a bit. But that's all the stuff that we've been watching. So let's get to uh, Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire. When the discovery of an ancient artifact unleashes an evil force, very generic, Ghostbusters new and old must join forces to protect their home and save the world from a second Ice Age. I think that second Ice Age movie was actually really good. I don't know why it's getting flamed in this logline. It's pretty fun. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's Frozen Empire, the, uh, I guess, obligatory sequel because... I guess they rebooted this and brought back some characters. Someone died in real life. They uh, kind of eased us off with a final goodbye that felt some way meaningful, but I guess it's also commercialized. I don't know what I feel about the last one, to be honest, but this Frozen Empire uh, packs a lot of characters into its story and 115 minute long runtime. So far, it hasn't been received like, pretty harshly or negatively it's just kind of in the middle there with a free on letterbox 6.6 on imdb a bit higher there and a 60 on metacritic uh it costs at least 100 million dollars to make i don't think we have a fixed budget yet on it and because we are recording this on the day that it comes out we don't really have a gross for it yet but i wouldn't be surprised if it actually does fairly well at the box office uh and it's um part of i guess columbia pictures uh 100 year uh, of existence uh under I, I guess now under sony is a that that's the distribution but um Lachlan, we're gonna have a spoiler review for ghostbusters frozen empire uh i think we both quite like the first one like the original one from back in the 70s 80s i don't actually know when it came out per se but then the sequels i'm not as familiar with i haven't seen the second one i haven't seen ghostbusters 2016 when the, when they're all women uh when they body swap it's actually really woke for 2016 where they uh yeah anyways <laughs> and then uh, i've only seen afterlife and the original um do you think ghostbusters is uh i guess one of those franchises that is getting milked at the moment or is there actually something of substance that comes out of these uh, i guess uh sequels that feel a bit unwarranted i think that there's it's a mixed bag if i'm totally honest i actually think that this film has been one of the better ones to kind of mix the two ideas together of here's an original and here's a here's a follow-on sequel in set in the same universe set in 2020 x or whatever yeah, um, yeah. So I, I do think that uh, there's a trend of film shot in 70s, 80s, 90s gets rebooted for a sequel in, as I said, 2000X. And there's quite a few plot points that happen in these kind of films. And those really annoy me. Mm -hmm. The first one, I think you will agree with. I hate it when they always reboot it with children. Like, why yeah. do they have to reboot <laughs> these stories with children? Back yes. in the 80s, they were... They were adults that were being used in these films. Now they're rebooting them for maybe a different audience. That's why they're using children. Yeah. But the that's not really going to benefit getting the original fans to come back if you're pitching it towards children, right? So with I Ghostbusters... Mean, I ahead. do have a theory on this, uh, that like if you have kids in there, you do have someone in their 40s. And I think the on on the meeting room producer level pitch is we get different like that's why there's a ton of characters in this. We get every demographic. We get the grandpas who used to be the dads when they took their kids mm. to Ghostbusters, and then you get the kids who grew up and maybe have their own family now. They're like the Paul Rudds, the Carrie Coon, and that sort of age. And then you're trying to get the new ones, the new uh, I guess generation in it as well. And it just like to me this whole film on. Unfortunately, feels like such a corporate way of just like we need another sequel, and uh, didn't really think about what's the story we got to tell with the actors we have, what's the storylines. It yeah. just feels like we need another entry. This one, this one in particular, I, I do think that the first one definitely has uh, a little bit more character to it. I guess definitely mm. tries to stay a bit more authentic to the original idea of Ghostbusters. Still, it's a bit different and it has the same villain it has the same sort of plot point but yeah. with this one 
they definitely modify the story quite a bit. And the moment that the whole film lost, I would almost say a whole star, if I'm honest, was when a giant fucking laser beam went up into the sky. I and laughed. We were fighting. I laughed out loud. I fucking laughed. And the best yeah. part was, it was an empty cinema. It was me and my dad. We went and went and saw the movie. It was super last minute, and I watched it last night. I was like, straight after work, came home. I was like, we should go watch Ghostbusters. Yeah, let's go watch Ghostbusters. We went and mm-hmm. watched Ghostbusters, and whole whole cinema to ourselves, right? Whole widescreen yeah. Dolby Atmos cinema. And when that moment happened, I could just laugh so loud, and I had such a great chuckle when that happened because it was so stupid it was like we are in 2024 and we have like that just shows how much this movie is just a a producer room of 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 uh not hangry you know they're not hungry and angry but they're hungry for money money hungry producers at the studio who Hey, after Madam Web, you just need a safe hit, so we need a sky beam at the end. Because what's a third act when it's said like it's about to be an ice age? And then, like again, spoiler warnings here: the whole confrontation with this like thing that was so terrifying that uh killed like that. that that's why like mythologies don't work if you set them up like thousands of years ago because you're so disconnected from it you can say like this thing killed and killed and killed like hundreds were killed this was a big war and then when it arrives because there's main characters here that we all know they can't be touched as it's so dumb because it undercuts like what the character ultimately is and it's just like a big frozen popsicle that i guess they gotta be they gotta stop but there's no tension ever in this film, like for a single moment. Um, and I thought that the the real one was actually quite terrifying with the possessing. And I think the the second one, there was always a lot of comedy in this in these films. But what I found is that like every single character is written the same way with the same type of uh, I don't take the danger actually seriously. And that's just kind of my quirk. The only person who is able to pull off uh, pull that off and has enough charisma to portray that silly goose energy is Paul Rudd and I think he shines he he without him this movie would be atrocious like it would be a one star in my opinion I think he elevates it like a whole uh, to, to a whole lot of great for me a whole lot of star level because like he has a couple of moments that actually are pretty funny even in like a really badly written script he somehow makes them work and uh, mm. the man doesn't age the man is also very funny and he has a lot of charisma. Uh, so I feel like that Paul Rudd, in my opinion, was the only thing a good, uh, the only good thing about this film. I don't know how you felt about uh, the characters. Uh, the characters themselves were quite bland. Like they had to kind of cause some sort of family rift. Uh, if you're going to have yeah. them come together in the first film, they do have to separate in the next one. That's just kind of how the story goes. That's how you make interesting characters. To have Phoebe, you know, lose herself, her, her identity of being a Ghostbuster makes her a bit more vulnerable. I do get that, but more a ghost I also Rizzler, find yeah. that, that, that Phoebe the, herself in the first film is definitely way more intelligent and way more yeah. with it. Uh, in this film, not so much. I don't know why they couldn't just play that off. But uh, the one thing I will say is just having a bunch of fun comedian characters come in as well was, was quite entertaining at least nanjiani was pretty decent out. as well i guess yeah he, he, yeah, he had, he had his moments. was great i guess it's but not the only unfortunate thing is that for that part right the the fire master part <laughs> this is <laughs> so dumb why did you make it all of a sudden like a magical thing like why couldn't we just leave ghostbusters like a science thing right like why did we have to have these magical fire wielding warriors that that stopped this being from why couldn't we just have like an actual like it all leads based to avatar ah, anyway that was the thing uh james uh a caster as well i i really enjoy him uh, i think he's a fantastic yeah he's comedian. funny um yeah and his he's great on taskmaster does, yeah he, his character was a little bit bland in this but i won't yeah. hold it to him I'll, I'll hold it to what i think might just be a pretty shocking screenplay because it has all of the the default template 2020 villain and 2020 
villain beam in the sky techniques, character yeah. plot points, you know, a betrayal by this friendly character. Like, like this film is very generic. I do think that it has a lot of heart to it, but I think that's just a little bit of uh, bias for the Ghostbusters in the film. Uh, there are, which you know, they they're not in it a heck of a lot except for Dan Aykroyd. He's pretty much in it the the entire way, along with um, Ernie Hudson. Uh, yeah. But other than that, like the film doesn't really have much more going for it. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I, I think uh, Finn Wolfhard is given like a lot of these moments that, like, to no fault of his own, are just like really hard to pull off, and it, it just doesn't work. Um, I think McKenna Grace is is fine, but she just like the the way the note that she has to play over and over again is really repetitive. When her character was to me annoying in the first one, uh, as this like I, because I hate the trope of the smart kids because kids are fucking stupid. Let them be stupid. Uh, and here it's about like her growing up and basically making mistakes by taking shortcuts. Uh, where she feels like she, she can feel like an adult in a way. That's kind of what they're going for in the story arc. But it's ultimately like undercut because nothing is meaningful to these characters, what it feels like. Even even at the end when they celebrate and the town is there and then the ghosts just fly around. I think the tone is just like not consistent with how silly it is and then how serious and, and terrifying... Um, this other ghostly creature is you would have to make it more on the note of it's just a big marshmallow or you know as soon as possession comes in you can have that silly thing with like they are the ones that are not as serious and then the ghost that possesses them is the over the top like dramatic thing but because this frozen popsicle guy doesn't really talk that much he's just like this old being who wants to take over it they don't play off each other that well and um yeah uh the previous characters are lucky and podcast i think like why i they in the story and then the whole thing with melody is just one too many storylines that get introduced into this like it's way more caught up with what melody's journey is over someone like th this new family unit uh like it feels so terribly written how uh the thing of um Phoebe seeing Gary as as uh, like a, a part of the family, uh, like that's kind of his main journey that he goes on. That like he he is a part of it. That's basically what he goes through. I think that's so underbaked when they ultimately get there when she she accidentally calls him dad. Um, it's just all of it was just um very lazily put together is is what I'll say. Like they focus on not like they could focus more on the dynamics between these characters and make that the central through line for the story but no they're so caught up with this mythology needing to introduce nadim um kumar nanjiani here and his fire bending ways for for, for for some reason there's a Patton oswald scene and i don't get why why is he in this like he has a short little it's um i don't know the choices in this film are just a bit baffling and um i i also don't think the like the the VFX look look too great. Uh, it took me out of it quite a quite a few times. Um, I mean, it's it's well done. It's just like uh, I don't know. Uh, they they still are mixing. Like the first one had some really oppressive stuff that I saw um, a breakdown of in one of the uh, latest uh, Cory the Digital videos, where they went over like a lot of the stuff is still practical and they kind of mix it. And I assume they do the same here. It's just. Uh, yeah, when there's nothing else to the story, you, you still just have a skeleton, even if that's like well built tech on a technical level. It just feels lesser when everything around it is ultimately like uh, yeah, pretty ne meaningless. Ghostbusters needs to have a practical villain that's you yeah. know they can they can poke fun of. They try doing the humor thing here with the villain and and the small villain's marshmallows. Just like, yeah, there there's yeah. Ghostbusters is. A comedy ghostbusters yeah. is not a serious like there is end of the world stuff but it was never like actually the end of the world it never felt like that mm -hmm. this one was way too serious in tone way too dramatic and just needed to take a chill pill uh literally uh which it did and needed to cool off and you know that's another pun that i just did there with with all of the cooling and this should blow off some hire you in batman 2 as dr freeze Exactly. 
Uh, don't mm. give me a fully CGI villain when yeah. they're not that entertaining. I, I had no engagement with it. Um, I knew the tropes of what the first film was going to do when, obviously, the dogs possess the, the two uh, humans and then they get together and then they're the gatekeeper and the keykeeper or whatever it is. Like, like mm. they're, they're just set standards and it was like, yeah, whatever. But with this one, it was just like, yeah, a villain, whatever. Who cares? Uh, yeah. Give me, give me ghosts that eats food. Give me, give me scary ghost lady from uh-huh. the library. Like there was so many yeah. callbacks to like the original ghost. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. To me, like okay, so, I I saw this in a not so empty theater uh, at a press screening, and the interesting thing was is that they usually don't invite like people who just get I don't know for sometimes right, in, especially in. Uh, the states they do still want for the press screenings a pretty full theater so i think they invite people in that get advanced screenings or did they win like a lottery thing and then they get to see it early they did it for this film for 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 uh, some reason and all of them decided to like eight of them sit behind me in the row and that it's just, just as soon as they sat down i was like oh fuck this, this is gonna be annoying as fuck and like they, they they had like uh they had like a uh, colored hair and, and shit like that i was like oh they're gonna be annoying as fuck um and they they were to to be honest uh they kept talking um uh well they, they talked a bit during the film as well but they kept like um I, I heard them like gasp at like the the smallest little moments that were just like a reveal of a character and shit like that i was like I, I guess it works for people when they're just like kind of trained that that's what we're getting. We are getting content uh, more than we are getting story. Just like reminders of other things that we do know. And it's all the substance that we get out of these revisited franchise films. And I think it's so incredibly disappointing that like that's the level of, of, of engagement that you need to cater to an audience and audiences are okay with it. Um, it's okay to go in and you spend money on something and you want to have a good time with with it, but it ultimately I think is that the sacrifice of um, actual good entertainment that we that we get. Uh, but I'm all doom and gloom here, uh, Lachlan. <laughs> unless you got something else to add, I'm I'm ready to share my ratings on. Uh, uh, I time. gave it two and a half. Me too, but I'm moving it down to two as we speak because I fucking hate this film. It, well, it's, it's, the more I think about it, well, the more annoying it gets. Uh, but yeah, that's it for that. Uh, let's move to our second uh, feature Roast main them. review. Roadhouse from Doug Lyman. Ex-UFC fighter Dalton takes a job as a bouncer at a Florida Keys roadhouse, only to discover that this paradise is not all it seems. Ayo. I feel like this place never looks like a paradise. It's just because there's water around. I guess, I guess that's enough if uh you are in in florida <laughs> like oh that's paradise it's chill there's a bunch of retired people here who are around um but roadhouse comes in at a runtime of 121 minutes so a bit longer for like a thriller like this uh it has been received uh pretty all right ish with a free on letterbox a free point uh, 6.4 on imdb and uh, a metacritic 6 so the same as the movie we just reviewed, they kind of received the same way. I feel differently about them, though. Uh, there was a bit of a controversy uh, around Doug Lyman and uh, Amazon uh, MGM, uh, where basically this movie didn't get a theatrical release and he wanted one. Um, and then it came out in negotiations that uh, there was a, a deal made that either they get 60 million to make this film and it goes theatrical or they get 85 and streaming. Uh, and I guess Doug Lyman still got to protest and complain even after getting 25 million uh, more. But it is streaming and widely accessible for everyone on Prime Video right now. And it, it is a remake of the original from 1989 that uh, cost 50 million, made 61. Um, I guess this one cost them 85 to make. And uh, do you think that this was worth the investment? Can you see all of the money on screen, the talent and the entertainment? Is it is it worth the investment uh, of 85 million for Amazon? Uh, I don't think I can say I saw the entire amount of money in the investment. I mean, I'm sure Jake Gyllenhaal is probably a costy actor to have. I do know. Million per six pack. That, uh... Like each muscle. Conor McGregor was very expensive to put in this film. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if that I, was I'd the greatest so. return on investment. Uh, not in the <laughs> sense that 
Yeah. The acting is terrible. Uh, it's the acting just not was terrible. In it that much, right? But I fucking loved it though. Mm-hmm. Oh god, I fucking loved him though. I can't get enough, especially when yeah. uh, he was like the most notorious fighter, and then it's like he's the most notorious. He's notorious, and I was like, that's the best. That's the ah, I love this film. <laughs> um, I'm I'm going to I'm going to sorry start off by saying that this is my favorite movie of the year. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. Okay. I'm, jo- I'm joking. I got him. I got. I got you so good. You were like, okay, I was just, what the just, fuck? <laughs> yeah, you were freaking out for a second. There, you're like, how the fuck? No, you. Um, I had a lot of fun with this uh, film. Shockingly, I was not expecting yeah. to actually have this much fun. Um, I found it stupid. I found it enjoyable. For me, I will happily say that this was some of the funnest action I've had in a film that wasn't super engaging. Uh, I would say that the the the, the narrative was a bit meh, but it honestly had it made up for it with how stupidly fun the film was and i just i guess haven't had stupid fun in a film in a while uh usually stupid mm-hmm. fun is like the 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 whole production value is just low so that yeah. 60 million can be seen but for me like th- this film was just fun i completely agree with you i had a good time and i wasn't expecting to have as good a time uh with this uh even knowing that this film is probably going to be pretty stupid in uh, on a narrative sense uh even on a character level it's it's pretty dumb but then they take off the shirts and then they start punching each other and oh, the com- the camera goes ape shit and just like it starts just zooming panning around down to their abs <laughs> <laughs> <He's> like, <"Mm-mm." laughs> yeah it's um it's it's so hectic but not in a way that like uh, you know, speaking of Doug Lyman, who who did uh, the Bo on one of some of the Bo movies, right? Born Identity, and I think was kind of that editing from that uh, whole franchise. I don't know if it was already in the first one, but like the action was so cut up. Uh, here, it, it seems to be. I'm still a bit bothered by how much it cuts, but it seems to kind of find a sweet spot where I can tolerate it. But the way that they throw each other around and like how brutal it is, and how I actually mm. feel like. Even for the stunt work, at, at points I'm like, oh shit, I hope they didn't hurt themselves like seriously there. Because it's, you you can see it all, what, what they do here. And it doesn't feel like they're like, I, I also watched the first one. And the way that they throw punches is like each time they go like, Doof! and then you got the classic like uh, higher pitch like noise of a, of a slap connecting. Oh, hit connecting. And it doesn't look like they're connecting. It feels like they're like playing. It's still really, really good, that original when it comes to the action. But this one just steps it up like a uh, whole lot of notch with, I guess, especially the Conor McGregor fights, uh, which I guess we don't get that many of uh, ultimately because he, he pops into the film um, <laughs> naked and not afraid uh, pretty late. Uh, but he's he's iconic as soon as he's on screen. And um, he's just like each time he, 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 he pops up, you're like, oh, what the fuck is he doing now? Oh, this is this is gonna what what is happening? And then he just like escalates to chaos, and uh, yeah, I found it pretty fun as well. I think that uh, a couple of the the really authentic things that made it a bit more exciting for me was just how serious Jake Gyllenhaal took this role. Yeah, I knew a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that he was training real hard, and he was going into the nutrition side. He was training with I think like an ex UFC fighter as well, so he he was really mm-hmm. well, you know. He was really diving himself head into this, uh, into the, fuck, what am I trying to say there? He was diving head first into this role uh, quite hard. Head The other the great role. thing, yeah, head butting the role. Now, that was, that was, um, Conor that was McGregor. A, a you never get that close moment. to somebody. Yeah, never get. Um, what I will say as yeah. well is like the, like, I remember being interested in this film when I saw that they shot a little bit live at a UFC uh, event and yeah. that started in the, and part in the octagon. And I was like, that's, really interesting to to see and i'm I'm glad that i could uh, when when they cut to those moments i'm like oh ah i know that moment um Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know what i did say that the story wasn't that great but honestly i don't mind the story i think it was simple enough to to make me care and i think that it was exciting enough for me to kind of keep locked in during the slower moments especially like during the opening him parking his car in the train tracks just tells you so much about the character itself just from that simple act of you know, he doesn't care about death. He's ready to die. And you can see that in the fights later on. And, and, and eventually, uh, Knox, Conor McGregor's character says it to him. He's like, there's something wrong with you. And he's like, there's something wrong with me as well. And, you know, they just keep fighting and fighting until one of them, you know, pretty much yeah. dies. 
Uh, but yeah, I, I I found the the other um, <laughs> uh, post Malone cameo because there was obviously him at the start of the film. I was like, yeah, there, there was a, there was a lot of uh, like singers uh, performers in the film. Uh, I think there was like Lucas Gage as well. Uh, I think he was in the film. I mean, yeah, Lucas Gage is the other guy. Uh, I don't think he is, does he also do, he's not he's not a singer. I think. Um, but I've seen him in a bunch of different roles. He, he's really good. Uh, he, he's good in in other parts. Uh, Down low, by the way, is out on mm. Netflix in the states now. Really funny film that played at last year's uh, South by Southwest. Uh, hilarious film uh, that he's also in. Um, but yeah, uh, the the first one is way more of like um, this guy comes in, Dalton comes in, and he's basically directing and improving this place uh, and teaching others to fight as well, uh, basically having a, a whole group of people around them. And the different route that they take in this with with uh, uh, Hall, where he's basically this this one man army that can't be stopped and goes about everything really calmly uh mm. is just it's a very fun character trope that they i don't think they stretch it too thin with how serious this movie takes itself i think it has that tension uh that it can build to thrilling moments without feeling like uh this this grandiose uh thrillers crime drama that it needs to set up it's always dumb and just kind of wants to get to the next moment where they fight each other and i think it, it doesn't really have any any disillusionment about disillusion about like what it ultimately is and i think that's to its strength um and why it didn't really take away from me the only place where i could see kind of shine through is with uh the little kid from the bookstore where I'm annoyed because she's a kid and she behaves like a six-year-old, but she she looks 16. I don't know how old the kid is supposed to be. I think that was just really bad. Uh, and it was kind of a callback to the original where there was like a, a store with an older guy, Red, that he had a friendship with and they end up burning uh, his place down in that in that film. Um, and I think that, that was kind of a thing that they wanted back in there, but a different dynamic, I guess. Uh, didn't work for me at all. But... Pretty much all of the rest is uh, is pretty fun. Um, I wasn't a big fan fan of the of the the romance subplot. I think that was just kind of fine. Uh, maybe it's also a bit of an issue that I have with the 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 actress uh, who who plays uh, the love interest. Uh, I think she's he's not given much, and usually in everything I've seen her in, um, uh, like in Fast X, I think she was also not really great and uh, Rat Catcher. Red Catcher, I think, was was all right, but didn't really stand out to me as something positive as well. Uh, I think she has a smaller role in Guardians Three. It says I, I forget what uh, that character is, but um, yeah, I think I think it was all right. It couldn't really lean on that dynamic too much, and uh, I, I like like towards the end. Again, spoilers here if you haven't seen it. Is that uh in the uh, that they kind of play with uh, having a damsel in distress that he needs to save, but it always feels like he kind of knows what other people's game plan is. Uh, like, she, he seems aware that she's not really there, but then she ends up being there. And it's like, to me, sometimes the, the lack of transparency with what he thinks is not as obvious as it needs to be. And that whole, like, little boat sequence where he blows up the boat and then they chase each other, to me, is a bit too messy and it's too grandiose and too over the top i still had fun with it but i thought it was really dumb just keep it fist fights and that's all they needed to do they had to grand scale it up somehow to raise the stakes but all they should have done is just fisty cuffs on the boat and then let him explode it because there was yeah yeah it needed it needed something more than just explosion and then run uh one thing i wanted to wanted to kind of say is this film is a poor man's point break. What, where do you see the parallels to to uh, point break? With those grand scale action moments. Um, and like, yeah. you know, you don't really want to like these guys because they're just, they're violent, but you do want to like them. Um, sort of an outsider. So like, like point break it is a completely different film, but I felt like the scale this film wanted to go to was just to the level of like, big action sort of right yeah yeah and Patrick no, i mean 
you do have the Patrick Swayze connection in, in there, yeah. Uh, the love interest from, I think, the first uh, movie, fr uh, like, from the original, also had, like, one of the actresses was also in Point Break. So there's a, even another connection that no one else has made. And, I mean, it's pretty pointless, but... Hey, it's dumb, and this movie is dumb, and but it, it's still pretty fun. Uh, did you want to talk about the cinematography real quick and the way that like it, it sometimes had even POV shots, and then it kind of had a sweeping oh, camera? Yeah. And then what do you think about like that uh, artistic choice? Interesting. I don't know what the film was shot on. I'm just trying to pull it up now. Seemed pretty digital. Mm, no, yeah, but I want to see if they've got that the... for sure. Because I think it must have just been like a GoPro that they strapped to. Uh, well, it didn't seem chest. like pretty wide angle uh like it didn't seem like super oh there wide was angle. when you when you when they were punching him i i, I guess it, it just switched from camera to camera so often that um oh no, no, no. it uses uh, you did a komodo those things are tiny komodo, yeah that is the, they are tiny yeah yeah and to uh, 1.8 lenses so they can focus real close as well so i don't know how yeah. um how they would be like maybe even that's why I thought it wasn't as as widescreen as yeah. uh, as wide as wide as maybe some shots like this would be uh, or could be. Um, so they yeah. used a. It looks like they must have used the um, the V Raptor, which is a, an 8K cinema camera, um, as mm -hmm. their main camera. Uh, yeah, yeah. Two two points of notice there: global shutter on the V Raptor. And also mm -hmm. now a Nikon company because Red was bought out by Nikon. So fun fact for everybody. Really? Um, oh, okay. Did you not know that? Did you did you hear about that? I no, I'm not keeping up with. Uh, the only thing I recently learned is that um, Red trademarked the name of of a raw recording footage. So I think everyone else has kind of screwed around calling the the raw footage on video that they call uh, that they record not raw. I think that's. I thought it was called yeah. Red Raw. Red code raw is yeah the I think the negative format oh. that they record on. Anyway, something then like it that. must have uh, then they must have used the Komodo for any of the like because you can just strap on a lens to that thing and basically just strap it to someone's chest. It's that they tiny. are pretty small um, yeah for cinema camera and sizes. They yeah. could have used yeah they could have used that essentially for any of the I would I would assume they use that for any of the when they were in the water like eye level shots and yeah. uh any of the action because it would have just been lighter to, to carry around than carrying a fucking bigger v raptor so yeah yeah and those uh lit lenses are also pretty small i'm pretty sure mm -hmm. yeah i think it had a distinct visual style that worked for for the story that they were telling um so ultimately good choice uh and i mean doug lyman does does make some interesting choices sometimes uh when when he makes his films looking at filmography i've seen seven uh, of his films uh, to date. Um, do you think this is one of his better ones or uh, yeah, where do you stand on him as a filmmaker overall as well? I have seen one, two, three, four, five, six, Chaos Walking, oh, uh, yeah. seven. Forget that he uh, made that. Seven yeah, of also his seven. films. And yeah. no, it's not. No? Not one of his better ones. What 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 do you think is, oh, is like his top three? Like oh, Edge of Tomorrow, Mister and Mrs. Smith, uh, Born Identity. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, it's also his three most popular films. I haven't seen American uh, Made. I haven't seen Swingers. I haven't seen Go. Sorry, or the I meant Wall. Chaos Walking, Chaos Walking, and Chaos Walking. Chaos Walking, and the rest is just in your mind because uh, you're yeah. a man, so your your thoughts can be. Also, oh, American Made is kind of is, is a lot of fun. I I, I like that. I haven't Tom, seen that one. I like that Tom Tom Cruise movie. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it's enjoyable uh, as an. There's action. some fans of Jumper, um, you know, that really yeah, like that I, one. Yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, it's like the only other Hayden Christensen movie that I've ever seen, but I yeah. don't say that's like that's his best. But I think that Chaos Walking is kind of skewing all of the shit down. So <laughs> yeah, I also saw uh, Lockdown, um, the the COVID movie that he made, and I think that one was also quite bad. Uh, with Anne Hathaway and Chevette, um, yeah, uh, it, it's not great. Aaron Taylor Johnson. Ooh. Yeah, the, he, he's got some interest. He's got an interesting filmography. Of course, mm. there's there's some action in there, a lot a lot of action actually, but uh, sometimes paired with sci-fi and uh, yeah, seems to be like uh, doing different things. Like he's not one who then does four different born films. He he does the one and then he moves on, uh, and I feel like yeah. that's 
in this day and age kind of commendable because I feel like it's not like he you know makes Mr. and Mrs. Smith and uh, I actually don't know how that one ends if you could continue it like this this potential I don't think Jumper I don't know if that did well at the box office but like Born Identity was continued he could have done that Edge of Tomorrow they could have uh, gone for like a, a sequel sooner um he he's keeping it interesting although uh, he, he's got some interesting choices as a filmmaker that he makes as well not always great uh, standing chaos walking uh, is existent uh but yeah i think that those are our thoughts on roadhouse uh i'm giving it a a three and a half out of five uh really had a good time with it and um yeah can I, uh, I too am giving it a three and a half out of five funnily enough yeah all right we'll we double we this. doubled up with our rating uh yes. wait no you dropped your rating for frozen empire never mind i did yeah i the only reason i gave it a two and a half is i thought it was better than afterlife and i gave afterlife a two and a half as well i think if i remember yeah. correctly you, and no, you don't have to explain yourself i get you i get you uh, it's, it's just it's just not very good you know that's what it is. <laughs> All right, Lachlan, if you were to pair this up with another film to make a double feature, uh, what would you pick? I said it earlier, but I feel like Point Break would be a really good one. Not the not the remake, because... Uh, I haven't seen the, the remake yet. The remake. Uh, but the yeah. remake is... Is, is it good is or is it bad? Compared to the, it, it, look, I like what it did. I think it set this... Like, it has a really big scale. And it does... Yeah. It does the action really well, but this narrative is just not there. It's a reptile. Has really big 1991, scale. Patrick Swayze. Oh, yeah. There's your connection to Roadhouse. Uh, that's my double feature. Good pick. I'm going with a classic uh, from Studio Ghibli, Kiki's Delivery Service. Uh, we haven't touched on this uh, yet, but uh, I'm, maybe I'm a bit more down than I usually am when it comes to the energy of these episodes. Because sadly, earlier this week, um, my little kitten that wasn't even two years old yet... Uh, was had to be put down uh she was sick and we couldn't really see that she was sick it was very unexpected i even make made like a kind of a, a joke post on instagram right before as we were at the vet because i i really thought she was just like having a cold or something and yeah it turned out it was it was really bad and then and there i had to make the decision to to let her go and it's been really tough and um it's been a couple of days that's why we ended up actually recording and i had did have a little bit of time to watch some stuff, but I ended up watching Kiki's Delivery Service uh, like three times over, uh, just on mute again and again um, on the night she passed. And it just really reminded me uh, what I love about this film and what I love about what I loved about uh, that little creature that stayed with me for uh, a couple of years. I still have a brother here, Shiji. Uh, he's just hanging out uh, next to me on the cat tower over there. Uh, and yeah. We've just been missing her. It's it's sad, but uh, I guess life goes on. And, um, you know, there's still art that inspired her name that I think is great. I moved up my rating for Kiki's Delivery Service from a three and a half to a five. Because, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I can't. I can't just, like, say that this is just... To me, it's just always going to remind me of her now. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's my double feature. A bit of, of, of a sad note, but uh, let's talk about some of the new films that came out uh, that are coming out this week uh stuff that uh you can go see uh is um among them is the taste of things um film that we both got in gun it's coming out on vod now uh, it ultimately didn't end up getting a oscar nomination although i think it would have deserved uh to be included there just a lot of like good international films this year then the beautiful game uh on netflix a movie about uh football uh soccer football that is uh yeah that's out on netflix and then a french remake of ventures of uh ventures of fear is uh also hitting netflix and then out in theaters we got godzilla x kong the new empire this movie comes out a week later in Switzerland. Hopefully, that will be the movie that we discuss next week. I can't guarantee it. Hopefully, I will see it in time uh, for our recording. And then, uh, in the lands of saints and sinners, Liam Neeson, uh, Irish, out there on um, I, I, he's a hitman. It's it's a pretty dumb movie. Uh, Kevin and I caught this one back in Venice. So if you're interested, I think on the Clips channel we do have a review for that out. If you're looking for it. Um, but yeah, that's out only in the States as far as I can see. 
out of limited release in the states as well is La Chimera, uh, the film that Lachlan you've been aching to rewatch, and uh, hopefully you get to uh, do that soon. Uh, Dogman, Luc Besson's latest film is out uh, in limited release, but it's also already out on VOD. You can find the places. If you want to see that, Wicked Little Letters is also out in limited release. And then in Swiss theaters, we got Anthony Hopkins led One Life that's coming out and Stop Making Sense, the uh, concert film, uh, highly regarded as, uh, well, like, widely regarded as one of, if not the best concert film ever made. Uh, that remake is, or oh, I guess the remaster of that uh, is uh, coming to Swiss theaters. Uh, and then in Australia, you are getting uh, Kung Fu Panda a bit late, but you're getting it now. Kung Fu Panda 4 is out for you. And also equally great, Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey 2 uh, is out in theaters. So Lachlan, if we can't get to Godzilla X Kong, I guess we'll cover Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey too. Uh, but that's it for this week. Again, if we can, uh, we'll talk about Godzilla X Kong. Um, and uh, yeah, Lachlan, anything else uh, you want to add to this week's to this week's reviews and episode? Who, who you gonna Who you gonna call? Boston makes us feel good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye. Bye. <laughs>